Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, today I'm going to talk about not only bariatric surgery, but uh, obesity as a whole. Pretty much I'm going to talk about multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of obesity. And I have no financial disclosures. Let's go back in time about uh, more than 30 years ago. Let's take a look at the obesity prevalence at that time in the United States. This was in 1985. The obesity was a problem at that time, but it wasn't terrible. The highest was 14% in some states, pretty much in the south. And uh, when the year, years uh, go by, we could see that it became more and more a problem. And we had a new color, 15 to 19%, those blue states. And we saw more and more blue states. And we had a new color in 1997, uh, yellow states. That's more than 20% of the obesity rate. And very soon, we realized that the blue states were going away and we started to see red states, more than 25%. And more and more red states, less and less blue states. And in 2009, Colorado was only blue state standing. And in 2010, even Colorado went down. So at this time, for quite a few years, uh, when obesity experts got together, we always say that in the United States, about two-thirds of our population, our adults, are, o are overweight. One-third are obese. And 17% of our children are obese. It's very sad news just revealed about a month ago. CDC just published their latest data on obesity rate in, in this country. It went up again. So we used to say about one third. Now is 37.7%, which means 35% of the men in this country and 40.4% of the women in this country are obese. That's BMI be above 30. For morbidly obese patients, the rate was 5.5% for, for men and, shockingly, almost 10% for women. 40, about 40. So at this rate, in about 10 years, we're going to see the nationwide obesity rate is going to be above 40%, which means four out of your 10 patients are going to be obese in about 10 years. And when we saw this Every year, increase of obesity rate. At the same time, we saw this increase of uh, diabetes incidence. We know that obesity is uh, one of the major risk factors for diabetes. It's, it's not surprising at all. There are quite many studies recently have shown that actually obesity has surpassed tobacco as a number one cause of preventable death. Preventable. And um, sadly, those patients need uh, need large coffins. So what, what, what are the views on obesity? Andrea and I were just talking about at the lunchtime. <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting that in the past, this is a view in the past. It's pretty much so, okay, this is a life, lifestyle choice. And uh, many people label the obese patients as the problem with their willpower or they have some psychological problems. Yeah. Until three years ago, AMA finally, finally designated obesity as a disease. It took the whole field about half a century, or actually, yeah, half a century, just to say that, okay, this is a disease. And now the whole medical society finally accepted that this is a disease. And uh, it is an uh, you know, epidemic in this modern environment. It has huge burden of, of its associated illness. And it has devastating effect on quality and efficacy of life. So the key thing here I want to tell everybody is that just don't think it's just a willpower issue. It's a patient flaw. For example, if a patient comes to see you with cancer, you may show great empathy for this patient. However, five or 10 years ago, many providers, if they see an obese patient, they not only they don't show too much empathy, but they blame the patient. It's all your fault. It's your fault that it become obese. We really want to change this concept. 
what's the reason for this epidemics of uh, obesity? There are many reasons. There is uh, genetic, there is environment, and I think the most important is this food industry. Just think about this: is that if you are, you know, a CEO of a food company, okay, you only sell your your products. What are you going to do? You're going to add more fat. You're going to add more sodium. You're going to add more sugar to your food to make it attractive to the consumers. And sadly, nowadays about 80% of our calories are from either processed foods or restaurant foods. This is especially a problem with, uh, for the people you know, in the minor minority population and in the poorer uh, populations. What are the treatment options for obesity? So we do have quite a few options, starting from comprehensive lifestyle program to behavior modification, dietary therapy, exercise, drug treatment, and weight loss surgery. So who are the candidates for the, for the treatment? So again, it's decided by the BMI and risk factors. So normal BMI is between 19 to 24.9. For those patients above BMI 25, between 25 to 29.9, by definition, that's overweight. If they have no cardiovascular disease risk factors or comorbidities, the risk is pretty low. So pretty much, you just need to advise them to prevent weight gain. For those patients, BMI between 25 to 29.9, but they have known risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or their BMI is between 30 to 34.9. This, this category called class one obesity. We need to advise them to lose weight. So there are quite a few ways to lose weight, such as diet, increased physical activity, and behavioral modification. For those patients, BMI is between 35 to 40. That's by definition class two obesity. They are at high risk. And for those BMI more than 40, that's morbidly obese. They are at very high risk. So they need to have a aggressive treatment plan, including lifestyle intervention or weight loss surgery. So this was uh, the AH American Heart Association American College of Cardiologists, the Obesity Society, these three authorities got together. They published this 2013 guideline for the treatment for overweight and obese, obesity in adults. I, I think you know, it's better for everybody to look at this. It starts from every visit. So when the patient comes to your door, every time they have to have the weight height measured to calculate the BMI. So based on BMI, we're going to decide what to do. If the BMI is normal, they just need to get advice to prevent weight gain. If the BMI is more than 25, then we need to assess their cardiovascular disease risk factors and the comorbidities. And it goes down here. Then we need to ask the history of weight and the lifestyle. We need to ask the patient if they have, yeah, we need to assess if there's a need for them to lose weight based on the BMI and the risk factors. Then we need to ask the patient if they are ready to make a move to lose the weight. If they are not, we need to advise them to do that. And the next thing to do is that we need to determine the weight loss goal and health goal with the patient. And then we need to advise them on comprehensive lifestyle intervention. There are two things I want to mention in this chart. Right here is that if the BMI is above 30 or 27 with comorbidities, they need to seriously start this in, in, uh, comprehensive lifestyle uh, change. Also, as a provider, you need to think about adding one of the medications to help them to lose weight. If the BMI is more than 30 or 35, with comorbidities. The patient should be referred to an experienced bariatric surgeon. And then after that, we need to assess whether or not they have achieved this 5% weight loss goal. If yes, 
we just need to follow up them regularly. If not, we need to start this whole process again. So this is an algorithm from the AHA guideline. So what is a comprehensive lifestyle program? It's a combination of diet, exercise, and uh, behavioral treatment. We usually ask the patient to regularly self-monitor the food intake, the physical activity, and the body weight. They don't have to weigh them every day, but we do encourage them to weigh them once a week. And we encourage every patient to change their behavior. And especially, they want, we want them to, mod, to go down their food intake, to modify their physical activity, and to control the stimuli in the environment that triggers eating. Dietary therapy, this is a very important part. I think this, you know, for most PCPs, this question may be asked many times. Because right now, you probably can find more than 100 dietary programs on the market, such as Weight Watcher, Jenny Craig, Slim Fast. There are just too many of them. Many patients may ask you, which one do you think is the best? The short answer is that everyone works. Everyone works to some extent. So there are so many different programs. You know, there, are, there are low calorie diet, there are low fat, low calorie diet, moderate fat, low, uh, uh, low calorie diet, low carbohydrate diets, and Mediter uh, Mediterranean diet. So your answer to the patient, it should be this way, is that everyone works, however, they usually work in the short term and they usually can only cause about a moderate amount of weight loss. The most important part is not which program, the most important part is this adherence. Adherence is the most important. Which program do you think you can stick to longer? And the goal for those programs is that 5% of total body weight loss in about six months. And some patients may lose a little bit more. If they cannot achieve this goal, they should come back to your office and have another discussion. Exercise is very important. We do encourage every one of our patients to exercise. However, one thing is that exercise has to be combined with a diet pro, uh, program. Because we know that exercise alone does not cause the patient to lose weight. The, our experience is that the most patients tell, tell us that once they increase exercise, the appetite goes up. They tend to eat more. How about the drugs? There are quite a few medications on the market that can be used for obese patients. The, the most used is still this medication that has been around for 20 or 30 years, Fentamin. Um, it's very, very cheap. That's a good thing. The problem with this medication is that the FDA only approved this medication for short-term use. So the FDA guideline is that they should be used for about three months. Um, I know that there are many providers actually keep the patient on this for a little bit longer. However, I personally, I don't think you should keep this for more than a year because there are just no data to support that. And the FDA says very clearly that it's recommended for short-term use. This medication called Qsemia holds the most promise. It is kind of a new medication. It's a combination medication of very low dose of fentanyl plus Topamax. Topamax is an anti medication. So the data is the most promising one because this one has been reported to cause about up to 8.5% of total body weight loss at one year. And at two years, it's close to about 10%. However, I also don't think this medication is going to pan out. And uh, the reason, there, there are a few reasons. One is that it's very expensive. This medication alone is about a few hundred dollars a month. At this moment, no insurance company covers that. Second is that I think, second is probably more important, is that this Topamax here is an anti medication. It has its side effects. So recently, the recent news is that this company actually withdraw the application to get approval from European Union because in EU, they're worried about the side effects of Topamax. It makes sense. 
I, I think it's hard for me to imagine that we can put this med uh, under seizure medication for a patient without seizure for life. Yeah. There are a few others. Um, this is a new one called the Belvic. All this data has been around for a while. And there's another new one called the Contrav. These three medications, they all cost about 3 to 5 percent of the total body weight loss. It, the problem is that it's not that much. And quite a few of them, actually all of them are very expensive. The biggest problem I see with the medication treatment is that once they stop, the weight always comes back. That's the biggest problem. And I don't see any of those medications can be used for life at this moment. So I think at this moment, I still believe that the medication treatment is, the role is limited. I think this is a very interesting study I want to share with everybody. It was published uh, last year. Uh, I think many patients may ask you, and you may ask yourself, is that when you see an obese patient in clinic, what is the chance for this patient to become normal weight next year? This is a very good question, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit better than that, a little bit better than that. Okay, I'll show you the data. This is a very good paper, you know. Uh, this is a, they, it, a lo very large study from UK. It has about 7% of the, all the data from the whole country's PCP database. Huge. It has 76,000 obese men, almost 100,000 obese women, with a follow-up of nine years. That's pretty good. And everybody had to have three BMI measurements to be enrolled in the study. So the first thing is that if the patient BMI is between 30 to 34.9, this is by definition class one obesity. It's not that bad. Yeah. It's not terrible. Yeah. Just a just little bit obese. The chance for this person to attain normal weight next year is one out of 210 for a man, one out of, two, uh, one, one out of 124 for a woman. That's pretty low. But we have to remember this. It can be much worse because once the patient weight goes up, once the BMI goes up, when the BMI reaches range of 40 to 45, the chance for this person to, to retain, to gain normal weight next year is one out of almost 1,300 for a man, one out of almost 700 for a woman. That's like getting a lottery. Yeah. That's like getting a lottery. Okay, let's not talking about this extreme, okay? Let's talk about 5% of the body weight loss. What do you mean by 5% of weight loss? It means that for 200-pound patients, 10-pound weight loss. For 300-pound patients, 15-pound weight loss. It's, it's not that dramatic. What's the chance of that? One out of eight for men, one out of seven for women. However, however, the problem is that even with this modest weight loss, 53% regained in two years, and almost 80% regained in five years. Yes. Very few people in UK use the drugs. Yeah. So this is a very very sad news. Yeah. Okay. There's another sad news that just came out about three months ago. I think. A lot of people heard this news, yeah. So, the, one of the very popular programs in this country for the obese people is, is The Biggest Loser. And, uh, you know, when you watch the show at the end, at the finale, everybody was so excited because a lot of them lost 100 pounds, even 200 pounds. However, what we really care is not that, you know, they lost the weight during the show. What we really care is that can they keep it for long? So recently, the, uh, one of the NIH groups started those patients. This is a season eight finalists, 16 of them. The NIH study group followed 14 out of 16, six years after this show. The sad news is that the majority of them gained the majority weight back. John, do you mind playing that video? So I want to show everybody a video. This is an article from the New York Times. It's a, it's a very good article if you have time Please read it. You just need to Google the biggest loser, gain the weight back. The number one is the New York Times article. And in this article, they do have a video talking about the two of the finalists, their story of gaining weight back after the show, if we can play it. So 
while John is doing that, uh, let me explain why they cannot keep the weight off. The NIH study what found was that once they lose the weight medically by exercise and the diet, the body's base metabolic rate goes down dramatically to conserve energy. Tries to bring the weight back to the original weight. The, the, we think in their brain there is some set point. Once the weight deviates from the set point, the body is trying their best, is trying to, their best to bring this back. Okay. So what the NIH group found was that every one of them consumed about 500 calories less than what they should be. You see how powerful the body is. Three, two, exhale. Good job. Rebecca Wright, a personal trainer, and her husband Daniel first met on season eight of The Biggest Loser. They together lost almost 250 pounds. But in the last six years, they've gained almost all the weight back. Daniel and I have never given up since Loser. We've seen some pretty big downfalls. We've put weight back on, but we never stopped being healthy. Wright participated in a recent study that helps explain why she and many other contestants have regained most of their weight. Two more. The more successful you are at losing weight, the slower your metabolism will be and the more hungry you'll be. Dr. Kevin Hall led the study. He's a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, and he says the findings show how hard the body fights back against weight loss. These uh, Biggest Loser folks, not only did they cut their calories, but they increased the amount of exercise that they're doing by an enormous amount. Hi. However, despite that, their metabolic rate slowed dramatically. Up. Press. On the metabolism side of things, your body is trying to slow down and resist further weight loss and uh, actually promote weight regain. And you're fighting against that at the same time as you're fighting against an increased appetite. Yes. So it's a little bit of a double whammy, and what happens to most people is that they, they can't uh, keep up the fight against the slowing of metabolism and the increased appetite, and so they slip backwards. And it's like asking someone to hold their breath. You can do it for a little while, but, uh, but it's very difficult to do it for much longer than you know, a minute or two. two. One. One okay. <laughs> two. So I think when you hear that you have a slower metabolism, you're a little disheartened. We are bombarded by messages that say, here are seven things you can do to boost your metabolism. Uh, I saw on the program at 4 p.m. today that if I eat this, I'll have a faster metabolism. It's this word that's been thrown around since I was I, as young as I can remember. I have to stop at Aldi and get wraps for burritos. So when you first hear you have a slow metabolism, you're a little disheartened because you're like, well, does that mean I'm set? What does this mean? Like, I'm just doomed. I'm never going to be able to lose weight. Does that mean you throw the towel in? No. I get to eat soon, Mia Moore. So now we know why this happens to us and why it's hard. So now it's like, oh, because someone, someone medically is saying, hey, it is hard. But it, the other answer is it's saying it's not impossible. There are people from the study who have maintained weight loss. So I think the point from the study is, oh, here's why I've been yo-yoing. So now what can I do to kind of design my life to not do that as much anymore? And this time doing it reasonably and doing it slower. So hopefully there's not this big swing that we saw after Biggest Loser. Can we go, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So this is a p pretty sad phenomenon, yeah. Because you think about this, no matter how, we, how hard we try, we fail. And uh, there's another unique thing about this, is that look at this. Uh, they are, they are not the classical obese patient in this country. Why is that? Because think about this. The show selected the most motivated, most fit obese patient in this country. It gave them the best program you could ever possibly imagine. And even the best results fail. That's the sad part. That's the reason that last year, three most prominent Obesity experts in this country got together, they wrote this comment and published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. What they are trying to tell everybody is that diet and exercise, exercise alone are no cure for obesity. So 
LA Times also saw this article. They published an editorial on this as well. Then you may want to ask me, is that, wow, this is a pretty bad data. Is, are there any hope for those obese patients? Let's go back to the guideline. I do think there is another way to deal with this problem. Is that when the patient's BMI is more than 40 or more than 35 with comorbidities, there is a choice for weight loss surgery. So who are the candidates for surgery? We say everybody with BMI more than 40, by definition, morbidity obesity. They qualify for surgery, and also they're going to benefit a lot from surgery. Anybody with BMI more than 35 with one of the comorbidities, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, severe joint pain, fatty liver disease, they also qualify for surgery. What are the surgical options? So a lot of us heard this name, the ruin Y gastric bypass surgery before. And uh, this is, we call it the gold standard for weight loss surgery. The reason we say gold standard is that because it has been around for so many years. We have been doing this for the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, nowadays, almost every procedure done in this country is laparoscopic surgery, which means tiny, tiny incisions. The biggest incision is probably half of this size, even, yeah. So what do we do uh, in bariatric surgery? Actually, for this surgery, we don't take out anything. We just divide the stomach using a stapler into two parts. One small part we call it a pouch. It's about 30 to 45 cc. We connect this part with the small intestine. When the food comes down from the esophagus, it goes through this pouch because the pouch is so small. So every time, the patient can only eat a little bit. Then the food goes down, it bypasses the majority part of the stomach and duodenum. The gastric juice, the pancreatic juice, bile comes from here and meets the food downstream. So we do bypass about 150 cc centimeter of the small bowel as well. How about the efficacy? Because we just talked about the biggest losers. They couldn't keep their weight off six years after the show. How about weight loss surgery? So this is one of the best studies done in Sweden. Why in Sweden? Although we do way more weight loss surgery than that country, the main reason is that they have the socialist system. They can track every patient from their birth to their death. So they have the best data set. And again, let's take a look. Diet alone, 15 years down the road, almost the same weight. And I just want to tell everybody that almost every study with more than three or five years follow-up shows exactly the same. If you just tell them to eat less, exercise more, this is going to be the curve. Almost every study, no exception. How about gastric bypass surgery? 15 years down in the road, they still were about close to about 30% down from their total body weight. And now we have 20 years data, it's about the same. So we know that the surgery lasts. So another operation I want to take, talk a little bit more is this called sleeve gastrectomy or gastric sleeve. Um, again, laparoscopic surgery, tiny, tiny incisions here. Yeah. What's the advantage? The patients have much, much less pain. And uh, generally speaking, nowadays, nationwide, the average length of stay is less than two days. A lot of my patients can go home after one night stay in the hospital. Some centers even send them home a few hours after surgery. What's the anatomy? Is there any difference from the bypass? Yeah, there's a huge difference. Yeah. There are two parts. First is that we do have to remove about 75% of the stomach. We say it's about 75 to 80% of the stomach. And after surgery, the stomach looks like a banana. It only has about 25 to 30% of the original volume. Second part, the best part is that we don't touch the small intestine. Yeah. We don't touch it. There is no malabsorption. There's no new connection. What's the advantage of that? That gives this operation much, much less complications. Yeah. So in terms of efficacy, it's very, very close to the ruin white gastric bypass surgery. However, much less fewer complications here. Yeah. 
Because for gastric bypass surgery, there's a risk for marginal ulcer. There's a risk for bile obstruction. There is a risk for nutrient deficiency. Those things we pretty rarely seen in this operation. Because of those reasons, right now, the sleep gastrectomy is the number one performed procedure in this country, and it's, it's go, going up every year. And technically, it's much easier to do. And uh, nowadays, most operations, if I do it with a resident, it's about actually about an, an hour, yeah, skin to skin time. Yeah. It's much faster. They re recover much faster. There's another option. I think most people heard that called the lap band or adjustable banding, O band. The concept is very simple. Okay? Let's put a rubber band around the upper part of the stomach and it cause some restriction. Um, what's the problem? I think you know, most, nowadays most people realize this is a procedure that can generate a lot of complications. The biggest problem is that although this surgery seems to be very simple and very safe at early stage, the problem is that it has a very, very high long-term complication rate. So the worldwide data shows that a, about a third of the patients who had lap band placed, at some time point, the lap band has to come out. Data from Europe with more than 10 years follow-up showed that after 14 years, the data from Netherlands showed that only 20% of the patients still had a good weight loss and still had a lap band, which means 80% failed in about 10 to 15 years. That's the reason that right now there's a sharp decline of lap band use worldwide, the same in this country. It used to be the number one precision in this country, and now it's less than 5%. It's going down every year. So I think in fact, in 10 years, we're going to see very, very few of those procedures. So are there other options? Yes. So last year, end of last year, this was, this was just approved by FDA into a gastric balloon. So put two, one balloon or two balloons in the stomach. And the indication for that is the BMI between 30 to 40. We know that it, it won't work well for the very high BMI patients here. Because the weight loss is not as good as the operations. However, the selling point here is that we can tell the patient that this is not a surgery. It's a, just an endoscopy. So the way we do this is that we do an endoscopy first, have a look at the stomach, it looks fine. We place these two balloons and we fill it with saline. Then they go home the same day, after half an hour. And after half a year, they come back, we have to remove the balloons. The good part, no surgery. Um, and it does have weight loss. The bad part is that it's very expensive. Right now it's about $8,000 to $10,000 uh, procedure. The balloon can only stay for about six months. We don't have the long-term data. We do have six-month data and one-year data. At one year, a lot of patients can still keep the weight off. However, it's hard for me to imagine five years down the road what's going to happen. Uh, one good thing is that they, they can get a second balloon if they want to, but that's another $8,000 or $10,000. And there's another one just came, came out. I just added this slide three days ago. FDA this week just approved another balloon. What's the difference? This one, it can be swallowed. So, you see, this is a balloon. In the office, I think there's a chance that um, you know, later on the PCPs maybe would do this. I, I don't think it's uh, yet, <laughs> because you, need, you do need a floor. So you just ask the patient to swallow this. And then under the floor machine, you see that, oh, it's in the stomach. You pull the string. You fill this balloon with, with air. And the first one uh, is only 200 cc. They come back in another month, you give another one. And in the third month, you give the third one. So total, I took the 600 cc volume to occupy the, at least half of the space in the stomach. Uh, again, it's approved for patients with BMI 30 to 40. And again, the balloon can only stay for six months. I, this is a concept I have to remind everybody. Okay, all the balloons can only stay for six months. Yeah. Why is that? Because if, we, if they stay too long, it, the balloons may rupture. And 
the balloon may cause compression to the stomach, can cause ulcers. I think the big, biggest worry is that the balloons may rupture, and it may go goes down to your small intestine and cause bowel obstruction. The, the, generally speaking, most surgeons or the most gastroenterologists recommend them to take the PPI to reduce the chance of ulcers. But other than that, pretty much not, nothing else needs to be done. What yes. percent of excess weight do they use with balloons? About 25 to 30 percent. Yeah. We usually say that about 20 to 40 pounds is a realistic goal for this. And uh, uh, there may be another balloon coming in a few years. I think that's, that may be a revolution. Because for this one, when we, when we remove the balloon, we still have to do an endoscopy. So there is another company right now, is in the, I think it's in the clinical trial phase. They are trying to design a balloon that can dissolve in about six months. So which means you swallow it in the office, you go home, and six months later it disappears. I think if that one can, can be on the market, that, that, that may be a revolution, because it saves an endoscopy, it saves lots of cost. It may make it become much more affordable, so more patients may use that. But I have to warn everybody here is that the balloons are not without complications. Yeah. So it has been reported that there's a very small risk for gastric perforation, esophageal injuries, and the, the balloon migration. The gastric outlet uh, obstruction is, is very, very rare because the volume we put in, we calculate very carefully. It's about 600 to 700 uh, c, 750 cc. It will not cause a gastric outlet obstruction in most cases. Uh, we, I have heard one or two patients had that, but it's very rare. Uh, reflux, generally speaking, is not a major problem, although we generally recommending them to take PPI. Um, the most you know, complaints from the patients that you know, usually is that right after we place a balloon, a lot of them, about 60-70% of them, uh, complain a lot of nausea and vomiting. There's a 20% chance that the patient may need to come back to our clinic to get IV hydration because the first few days they have so much nausea. But that usually goes away after about three days. Okay, the first question is the microbiome. It's a very, very, very hot research topic. One example was that, uh, you know, the, for example, fecal transplantation has been used to treat C. diff colitis. One of the side effects I have noticed, one patient got the, uh, the fecal transplantation from one of her relatives. And after that, her C. diff colitis got much better. However, the problem was that she was gaining weight like crazy because the relative you know, of hers was obese. However, uh, even though a lot of research have been done, uh, there are some trials in Europe have been done that they, they did fecal transplantation to treat obesity. Um, they did not see any weight loss. The only thing they saw was uh, increased sensitivity of uh, insulin sensitivity. Uh, I do think that the fecal, uh, I do think the microbiome is going to be a very, very good research topic. But in terms of clinical use, it's probably about 10 or 20 years from now. Second uh, thing, when that medication I have not heard of yet. Um, there are so many medications right now, they claim that they can cause some weight loss. The problem is that when we apply them to the general population, usually the data is not as good as what they treat with a specific population. So I think we, we need to give it time to see whether that's the case. If it's 10 percent of total body weight loss for a medication, that's very dramatic, I have to say. OK, there is another device just uh, got approved by FDA about two or three months ago, which I really don't like, really don't like. <laughs> it's, they call it an uh, ice bio system. It's pretty much a G-tube. Okay. They put a G-tube in your stomach. Basically, the patient can eat whatever they like. They can go to the steakhouse tonight here. Yeah. After they eat, they go to the restroom. They spend about 10 or 15 uh, minutes and aspirate all the content from the stomach. Basically, we tell them that you can, now you can legally binge eat without any consequence. I don't like it. And uh, also, <laughs> this, uh, you know, they have a you know, one-way valve here. They control that. Uh, you know, only, I think they can be only used certain uh, times which means every three to six months, you have to go to the surgeon to get a new system. And as a surgeon, I do stomach surgery all the time. I do think that over time, this may develop complications. So I don't think 
this thing is going to work for the majority of our patients. So <laughs> it's a great question. I'm, I was not among the panels. <laughs> um, I think he said, the only thing I can think is that, you know, for some specific population, for example, they have a very high risk for any other major surgery. And you put this, this may temporarily help them. That's the only indication I can think. For FDA, the reason they got approved is that they did show efficacy. I don't think FDA definitely look at all the whole ethic thing that carefully. Yeah. But again, I'm not an expert on that panel. Yeah. Um, I don't think any insurance company is going to pay for this. And I personally do not recommend this procedure. And I will not do this procedure for weight loss purposes. Yeah. I do put the G-tubes for other patients who need the nutrition. Yeah. So why does uh, weight loss surgery work? Uh, for the surgeons, most, most, most of us are pretty simple. We think, oh, this is just restriction. And some procedures, for example, bypass have a little bit of malabsorption. But uh, uh, most researchers, they think beyond this. They do think that there is endocrine, there are, there are hormones, there may be actually uh, a neuronal, there may be gut-to-brain interaction. So there are a lot of very, very exciting things in the labs are going on. Hopefully, in the next 20 or 30 years, we can see some of those we can use in the clinical practice. So for example, one of the most studied hormones called ghrelin, and we think that's the hunger hormone. Although the data is, I have to say that it's not very consistent, it's still a little bit controversial, but most people think it's a hunger hormone. The ghrelin is secreted by the stomach in this area mostly. When we did the bypass, the foot does not touch this area. <coughs> when we did the sleeve, we removed this area. So the ghrelin goes down dramatically after either operation. And after that, we think that the reason most patients don't feel hungry was because we removed the ghrelin. This is, again, this is just one of the theories. So, yes, the stomach is still here, but it does not secrete ghrelin. So when you measure the ghrelin concentration after gastric bypass surgery, it's much, much lower. As a bariatric surgeon, for me, the weight in itself is not the most important. The most important part are the comorbidities. Yeah. Because I know that the obesity can cause a series of medical problems. Let's take a look. From head to toe, it can cause migraine, pseudotumor, high cholesterol, fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, venous stasis, gout, depression, sleep apnea, asthma, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, GERD, stress urinary incontinence, joint pain. And a lot of us probably don't know or don't know how much is cancer. So how about after weight loss surgery? Is there any benefit for those things? This is a very nice figure made by the Cleveland Clinic of Florida. They summarized all the available data. They made this figure. Let's take a look again. Migraine after weight loss surgery, if they lose enough weight, 57% resolved. Pseudotumor, cl close to 100% resolution. High cholesterol, 63% resolved. Fatty liver disease, 85 to 90%, if we catch it at early stage, it can be reversed. Metabolic syndrome, 80% resolved. Type 2 diabetes, this is very dramatic. The data shows that about 70 to 80% of the patients, one year after surgery, they don't need any diabetic medications. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, 79 to 100% symptomatic relief. Venus stasis, 95% resolved. Gout, 72% resolved. Quality of life, 95% of our patients felt that life was much, much better. About 90% of them will tell us that's probably one of the best decisions ever, ever made in their life. Depression, it's a little bit controversial. Some, most studies show that about half can get better. Sleep apnea, 70 to 90% no longer need the CPAP machine. Asthma, 80% can, can get improved. Heart attack, up to 82% risk reduction. High, high blood pressure, 52 to 92% improvement or resolution. Reflux, 
72 to 98 percent resolved after gastric bypass surgery. You know, incontinence, 40, 40, 80 percent better. Joint pain, 40 to 70 percent better. That was a 78 percent reduction of the obesity related cancer risk. So, altogether, the end effect is that Canadian study showed 89 percent reduction of five year mortality. So, at this moment, at least four studies have shown very similar results. Uh, VA study last year showed a 58 percent reduction of five year and 10 year mortality. Utah study, 40 percent reduction. Swedish study, 29 percent reduction. So this is a, another piece of data to show that it improves high blood pressure and it improves cholesterol. Two large studies with six year uh, and three year follow up showed about 60 percent resolution of high cholesterol. This is one of the best studies for diabetes yeah, because this is a randomized clinical trial. Uh, it, it was done at the Cleveland Clinic. So we could see that three groups. First one is a medical management group, second one is sleep gastrectomy group, third one is gastric bypass group. 36 months, three years. Three years later, the medical group, the weight, they lost a few pounds. Yeah, BMI down by one, that's like three to five pounds. How about sleep? BMI decreased by eight, bypass about 10. Yes? It is true that the medical management group don't lose weight overall. But those that do lose weight and actually get down to their ideal weight, and there are some that do on medical management, they achieve the same results as the gastric bypass, don't they? Yes, that's a great question, yeah. So the data I just showed here, this, is not only to gastric bypass surgery. As long as you can lose the weight, you're going to achieve very similar results. The only problem with this medical management is that the majority of them cannot achieve that goal. However, Tom, you have a great point. If they can achieve the same goal, they get the same benefit. Yes, please. In terms of the uh, bariatric population, after they lose all that weight, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. With the uh, patients that had bariatric surgery yes. after they lose all the weight, does their metabolic rate decrease the same so, way? It's wow, a great question. I, I just checked that yesterday. Mm -hmm. A little bit controversial. Some groups show that also their metabolic rate also goes down a little bit, not as much as those the biggest losers. But yesterday I saw an article, the study done by the same group, the NIH group. What they see was that they had a matched weight loss between the gastric bypass surgery patients from Vanderbilt and the biggest losers from Los Angeles. They lost exactly almost the same amount of weight. The biggest loser group, they had a huge metabolic adaptation, which means they consume much less calories. The bariatric surgery group, 12 months later, they have zero metabolic adaptation. Why is that? Do you understand that? I do not know exactly, yeah. Actually, this is a very good question. Um, the past Friday, I was in a research meeting, and I just had an expert, expert panel they are very, very interested in this phenomenon. They actually want to get a proposal to study why there is this, they call it metabolic memory. Yes. Okay, on, uh, on Belvic, yes. it, 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 or Catherine, it's modest weight loss, right? It's 5% 5%, less. yes. Right, yes. but the contrave mm -hmm. is more than, it's like 8% contrave? Contrave, I think, is about between 3 to 5% range. range. Yeah. It's, not, it's the only medication you know, achieve 8% was uh, Qsemia. Right, but the contrave is indicated for long-term <coughs> use, right? I mean, you can yes. use that forever. Yes, I, again, it's, it's, uh, it's intended for this purpose. However, in the clinical practice, I think very few providers are using contrary. Right. Okay. Yes. I use it quite a bit. You use it quite a bit? Some success, yeah. But again, the weight loss is moderate, very moderate, 3 to 5%. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say yes. Yes. But maybe a little more if you really motivate people, but uh, that's another subject. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, please. When you had the BMI of greater than 35, yeah. what percentage of those patients at least have one of those comorbidities because the population that would be interesting to me yeah. was that ones that are greater than 35 that don't carry those comorbid conditions, just length of duration that they had the obesity? Yeah. That's the only thing. Yeah, so that's a very good question, you know. Uh, how about, you know, those patients, especially I think the patients between BMI 35 to 40, you know, yeah. 
what's the chance of not having any of those comorbidity? The chances are very small. Because think about this, is that about 25% of the bariatric population has diabetes, another 30% have high blood pressure, and about two thirds of them have sleep apnea. Hi. Yes, please. I'm a fat girl. I've gained and lost weight over my lifetime, thousands of pounds. One of the things that I admit. Please don't call yourself a fat girl. Yeah. <laughs> in any event, my observation is that when I get down to a certain weight, a, a certain limited amount of fat on my body, my, my, my metabolism changes. Is that true? Absolutely, yes. That's the thing we, talk, we just talked about, this metabolic adaptation. When you lose weight by diet and exercise, and your body senses this, and your body, you know, unconsciously, this out of your control, shuts down your metabolism. But mine is it, the opposite. If I have a less amount of fat, I can eat more. It's about, it, it has to do with the amount of fat on my body. It, actually, we don't know that, um, because the bariatric patient population, they lose more non-fat mass than the biggest losers. The biggest losers actually they lose the most of the weight from the fat mass. However, they have much more metabolic adaptation or metabolic memory. Interesting. In, very interesting, yeah. The if I get skinny, I stay skinny. If I get fat, I get fat. Yeah, I, I've noticed the same yes. thing in myself. Mm -hmm. Actually, I can eat more when I'm thin, but I think it's because I'm a whole lot more active. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, when you get thin, you eat more, uh, it could be uh, many, uh, many things. One is that your body is telling you that actually you may not realize that this, uh, I don't like this, I don't like this status. Uh, you know, your body is trying to bring you to that set point. And uh, that will stimulate your, your appetite. Another thing is that we, all, we just talked about exercise alone will not cure obesity because when you exercise more, your appetite goes up. You feel more hungry. I have two. I have two questions, but they're kind of related. I think everybody can hear me anyway. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, I my, my first thought when I heard when I saw your sleeve gastric gastrectomy, gastrectomy yeah. was the old days of the gastric stapling, um, and that was like 1978 to the mid 1980s, where basically the same thing was done. People came in with a stapler and stapled. Um, along the uh, along the, uh, the 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 uh, along the stomach and, yeah. and and all those patients either had complications or regained their weight, and so one of the things I'd I'd like to hear more from is the failure of bariatric surgery and the theories about why it 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 is felt to fail. Um, we know that people with lap bands, you know, in my experience, 100% of them have gained their weight back within three years. Um, with the gastric, with the old gastric stapling, those patients tended to just ex re-expand their pouch and gain their weight back. Um, so it's a great, even great in question. The, yeah. Even yeah. in the Ruin Y bypass, yeah, yeah. where we hope that the malabsorption continues after the pouch expands, we see patients that gain a lot of their weight back. Yeah. So could you talk yes, about yes. the mechanisms yes, yes, by yes, which yeah. you okay. think that happens? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So weight regain after bariatric surgery is a problem. Okay. I just want to be very honest with everybody here is that there's not a single solution that's going to cure 100% of the obese patients. There's none. If you achieve that, you're going to have a lot of complications. For example, there's another operation I, I, I didn't talk about. It's called a duodenal switch. It's a great operation, yeah. And uh, you can make a 400, 500 pounds patient go to 150 pounds. The, great, the good part is that it works well. It works really well. The bad part, it works too well which means a lot of patients may develop, develop mild absorption. So the way we designed gastric bypass surgery and gastric sleeve surgery is that we want them to achieve for bypass surgery about 70 to 80 percent of excess weight, for sleeve about 60 to 70 percent of excess weight. Uh, unfortunately, it's about, the data shows that about 10 to 20 percent of them over the time gain a lot of weight back. So the, all the data I showed you, for example, this, this is the average which means some patients do better, some patients do a little bit worse. And we know that over time, about 10 to 20 percent of them will have a significant weight regain. For gastric bypass surgery, we have data up to 20 years. I personally did a study at Duke 
I had a follow-up for 11 years. Again, the average weight loss is still very good. However, I, we always see about close to 20% of them gain a significant amount of weight back. For sleep, we have five-year data and we have eight-year data. We don't have more than 10-year data you know, for a large cohort for sleep. And the five-year data and eight-year data still show the very similar to gastric bypass surgery. Again, still about 20% of them will gain a lot of weight back. However, look at the other way is that weight loss surgery has about 80 to 90% chance to become successful in the long term. However, if you're just talking about medical management, that's probably about 5 to 10% of the long-term success rate. So I still think there's a huge benefit. Yes, Bill? Yeah, my wife wanted me to ask this question. She's done a lot of reading uh, on weight loss, postmenopausal women and <laughs> hormones. And everything that says that it, it does make it much, much more difficult for women in that stage to lose weight. And I'm just wondering if that's true and if that also is true if you do have the bypass surgeries versus just uh, diet and exercise alone, how much of an impact is that, the hormonal side for women? It's a great question, yeah. So we know that actually uh, for obesity also increase with age. For the age group between 30 to 50, they l likely have the highest obesity rate. We do not know exactly why. Hormones may play a role. Another thing is that what about the hormonal change after weight loss surgery? Generally speaking, it's all good. So we know that a few examples, for example, for the patient with PCOS, they usually have irregular periods before surgery. And right after surgery, about 80 to 100% of them can restore the regular periods. And we know about the fertility. Obesity is one of the main reasons for infertility in women. And after weight loss, no matter what kind of weight loss, as long as you have the weight loss, significant amount of weight loss, about 50% of those can become pregnant without any other help. And we know in men, they either bypass surgery or sleep gastrectomy, there are more than 30 or 50 publications already show that there, there was increase of testosterone level naturally. That's naturally. So we know that actually for most hormones, it's a very good effect. Only downside would be that for bypass surgery, we do see a little bit increase of osteoporosis. Yes, Tom. Um, you, you stated that exercise alone can't cause... Can cure obesity. Weight, cure obesity, but it's been my ob observation in some cases that's not true. For example, I don't think I've ever seen an obese postal carrier who walks all day carrying mail. I had a patient once who was 300 pounds, took a job as operating a jackhammer and lost 150 pounds in a year, mm -hmm. went back to a desk job, went back up to 300 uh, within a couple of years, but didn't change his diet. So I, I, I'm not, and, uh, you know, lumberjack working eight hours a day sawing logs, they're all thin. I, I think the, the fact is we are so inactive today with the labor-saving devices and electronic assistance we have, we don't do anything. I, I, that part I agree with you. I think uh, there are many reasons this country becomes so obese. Yeah. For example, 100 years ago, a lot of us actually are not going to be here attending a meeting. We probably are on the field doing hunting or you know, you know, trying to harvest you know, crops, other things. We, we would have been very physically active. But nowadays, the majority of this population actually does office job, yeah, for sure. What, what I, I think in general exercise is good. So there's no question that we promote exercise. However, you know, as a population-wise strategy to fight against obesity, if you just stress exercise it itself, I think for the majority of them will not work. Unless... They work because they don't do it. Yes. Uh, that's part of it. But also, you really need to tell them that at the same time, they need to control what they eat. Yeah, we. <laughs> All right. Seems that I cannot finish. It's okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. We we have six minutes left for for him, and he wants to finish his slides. But oh, I a question. We've been, would you rather finish first? How about let me finish first, then we can ask questions. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just skip this. You know, trial. Anyway, it shows that uh, this is a one C drop. Yeah. After both operations. Yeah. Huge. And just remember, this patient, a lot of them actually did not need to use insulin anymore. And this is shows that you know, the 
large vessel, uh, the small vessel disease complication after bypass goes down after 20 years. The large vessel complication from diabetes goes down. And uh, I'm going to skip this. How about heart attack risk? This is a meta-analysis of four studies altogether, close to 50% of reduction of heart attack. How about stroke? Meta-analysis of six studies together, more than 50%, about 58% reduction of stroke risk. And this shows that it can reverse NASH at early stage. And a lot of us probably don't know that a lot of cancers are related to obesity. For example, endometrium cancer, 49% related to overweight or obesity. Breast cancer, 17%. How about after weight loss surgery? Meta-analysis of four studies, 50% reduction of cancer risk. I'm going to skip all this, the improve, uh, improvement of quality of life and uh, improved fertility. And uh, about 70 to 90 percent of the patients after weight loss surgery no longer need a CPAP machine. This is for sleep apnea, very convincing. And even for adolescents, the data show that it's beneficial. How about safety? I think that's another thing that concerns a lot of the primary care physicians. You got to think that, okay, this surgery may be dangerous. <laughs> Let's think about it this way, okay? Let's take a look at the data, okay? We made a huge improvement in the last 10 to 15 years. Between 2002 to 2009, the mortality rate for weight loss surgery decreased by about sevenfold. And nowadays, weight loss surgery is even safer than a gallbladder surgery and hip replacement. Chance for dying from gallbladder surgery in this country is about 0.7 percent. Hip replacement, 0.9 percent. Weight loss surgery, one out of a thousand. I think, sadly, for this whole field, I think the, the things we battle the most nowadays is not surgery itself, because surgery becomes very standard. It's this negative attitude towards obesity. And the nationwide, it's very sad, is that less than 1% of the eligible patients had weight loss surgery every year in this country. There's about more than 20 million of U.S. adult population qualified for surgery. Every year, we're doing less than 200,000 cases. So 99% of them, they don't want to talk about this even. Very, very interesting data. Okay, I really want to show you, even though I only have a few minutes left, is that very good study from Northern and Southern California Kaiser and a large HMO in Minnesota. They look at all the diabetic obese patients. The question is that if they had weight loss surgery, how many years of life expectancy they gained because of surgery. Simple, three lines. The middle line is this 45-year-old woman. This line is a 30-year-old. This line is 60-year-old. Let's take a look at the middle line. A 45-year-old woman with age of 45, with being of 45. This woman gained about 6.7 years of life because she had weight loss surgery. However, the point here is, if this woman is less heavy, if the BMI is only 35 instead of 45, if this woman is younger, she's only 30 years old instead of 60 years old or 45 years old, this woman gained close to 12 years of life based on this formula. Which means to us is that let's not wait too long, let's not reserve the surgery as a last resort. We want to tackle this problem when they are not that big when they are not that old. We don't want the end organ damage to happen because of diabetes. A little bit uh, uh, talk about our, what, our approach at UCLA. We got this new center called Center for Obesity and Metabolic Health established about three years ago. It's a multidisciplinary group. We have two surgeons, two pediatricians, one hepatologist and two dietitians. And every week, we got together, we see patients in the same clinic, trying to help the obese patients. We also have one program just to teach the patients about the lifestyle change. It's an eight-week class. We have this called Risk Factor Obesity Program that give patients 
the, the meal supplements. And uh, we just studied this new thing. We know that for cancer patients, when they go to a big medical center, they have this tumor board. So we think that for obese patients, it may be better if we have an obesity board. So we just started this about four months ago. Now we have a monthly meeting to talk about difficult patients. Yeah. So two surgeons, two pediatricians, one hepatologist, two dietitians, we got together. If we have a different patient, we discuss as a group. It's very important for PCPs to talk to patients about obesity, especially the danger of obesity and the benefit for weight loss. Because one, one example I can give everybody is that we got a lot of referral once, uh, once we established a center. But the problem is that when we call those patients saying, that, oh, your primary care physician referred you to us, do you want to come to see us? 50% of the time, they don't want to come. Yeah. Why is that? Because the primary care physician only put a referral but did not talk to them in detail about the need to see an obesity specialist. Again, I wish everybody can follow this algorithm. Yeah. Especially, think about this BMI more than 30 or 27 with the comorbidities. Think about adding either Contraf or Qsemia or Fentamin at least for the short term, or if their BMI is more than 40 or 35 with comorbidities, thinking about sending them to a bariatric surgeon. So in summary, obesity is a serious medical condition and disease. Please remember, this is not a lifestyle choice or preference. Please do not discriminate those patients. Please do not blame those patients. I know that nobody is going to blame the cancer patients. <laughs> and, uh, Obese patients, especially morbidly obese patients, should be managed by a multidisciplinary team. Treat and or refer obese patients based on patient's BMI and comorbidity. This may be the take home message. This is what I usually tell my patients. If you are obese, especially if you are morbidly obese, based on the data I know, not having weight loss surgery is much more dangerous than having weight loss surgery in the long term. All right, we. Okay, we're going to go on a 15 minute break after Gary gets his last question. <laughs> yes, Thank you yes. First of all, for an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, I have a two part question. First of all, when people, most of our practices, I think, deal more with people that are not at a surgical level of obesity yes. yet. They're at a medical level, maybe their BMI is 33 and they have no comorbidities or they're 28. Uh, my first question is. If you lose weight from, say, a BMI of 29 down to 22, do you still get substantial benefit, or were you already at such a low risk that you're not going to get much benefit? And then part B of that question really is with these people that are not surgical um, candidates yet for obesity, and hopefully won't be, what, what do we do with them? You said we put them on Qsimi or Contrave, but that's only for a year, maybe two. And this is a lifelong deal. And finally, a comment. You kept saying not to blame them and not to make them feel bad and all that. And I agree we should be compassionate. But I get the best results when I make my patients feel <laughs> responsible. And I tell them, look, I'm overweight. My BMI is 27. I'm not where I want to be at 23. And I know how I got there, OK? <laughs> and I know I can change that behavior. So I think if you make them responsible and tell them, look, you are a little overweight and you can control that. They do better than if you tell them, poor you, you have a disease, you're a victim. Anyway, sorry, my questions. The, the, all those are great, great questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. BMI yeah. From yeah. So first question is the BMI from 28 to 22, do they get the same benefit? It's a great question. We do not have a large data to back that yeah, statement. However, I think uh, anecdotally, I believe they do benefit. For example, we know that the weight, every BMI increase is going to have a direct increase of chance to develop diabetes. Every you know, 10 pound weight, weight gain is associated with about one or two percent increased chance to develop sleep apnea. So in general speaking, I would say that any weight loss is good. Although the data in terms of mortality rate uh, which BMI group has the, the least morta mortality rate is still controversial. That part I have to say. Yeah. However, we do believe that for most patients, weight loss is good. And uh, your last question would be that uh, blaming the patients. I think 
the, it, what you told me is not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that for so many years in this whole field, there's ignorance uh, uh, of obesity. And uh, uh, most, many providers actually, they, when they see obese patients, they just feel that, oh, that's their responsibility. I'm not going to address that. Your approach is very different. You, you are going to address that and you put a responsibility on them. I think that's different. So it's not, that's not discrimination or ignorance. Yeah. What's your second question again? You have a the second question, was, uh, second question was how to manage yeah. that person with a I BMI agree. of 33 that you know, yeah, we're going to understand. deal with for life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a very, very tough question. Yeah. I do not, actually the whole field does not have a great answer for you. We kind of have, have an answer for the morbidity obese patients. Uh, this, that's the, choice, that's a, the, the choice is surgery. Um, we kind of have an answer for BMI more than 35 with comorbidity. And the very difficult part of the patient uh, uh, population to manage would be that between 30 to 40 without comorbidities. What do we do with them? I would say that at this moment the choices are very limited yeah, in terms of medical management. Uh, other than tell them that they need to change their lifestyle, you could send them to a dietitian. You could encourage them to enroll in any of the commercial programs with Watcher Genic Craig, although the efficacy is debatable. Um, I do think that uh, in a few years, hopefully, the new balloons will come, will become more widely used. But again, that's six months. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I just, we don't have good ways to deal with that patient population.